looking forward to doing some good work together uh, on this subcommittee. Um, let me welcome the acting administrator of uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Bob Fenton. This is his second tour of duty in this acting capacity, and we are grateful to him for his willingness to shuttle uh, back and forth from his responsibilities on the West Coast uh, to uh, help us during these uh, interim uh, interregnum periods. Uh, we're going to examine today the agency's response to COVID-19 and other challenges in emergency management. Um, we're thankful that you're here to testify before us in person. Uh, FEMA exists to coordinate the federal government's role in disaster preparation, prevention, and relief. And we typically see FEMA serve as an emergency manager when there's a certain area of the country that's hit with a natural disaster. But COVID-19, it impacted the whole country and the size and the scale of the federal response has really been like nothing we've ever seen before. Uh, FEMA estimates that obligations for COVID relief through fiscal year 2021 are going to be somewhere north of $115 billion. That's more than double the Department of Homeland Security's annual discretionary budget. Um, and I want to acknowledge at the outset um, all the great work that's been done by emergency management uh, personnel at the federal, state, and local levels who have just worked tirelessly over the past year to respond to um, and confront this pandemic. Um, we all thank them, uh, your staff in particular, for their ongoing work. When COVID-19 was declared an emergency uh, back in March of last year, FEMA was directed to lead a whole of government federal response to the pandemic. But a coordinated federal response for all intents and purposes did not materialize. Instead, the Trump administration decided to outsource most of the disaster responsibility to states, to local governments, and to private health systems. On many days, my state's leaders will tell you the federal government was sometimes more of a hindrance than a help. There was a lot of confusion amongst non-federal governments and healthcare providers regarding overlapping roles and responsibilities of our federal response agencies. Some days it seemed like FEMA was in charge. Other days it looked like the White House task force was in the driver's seats. Other times HHS appeared to be calling the shots. GAO cited one federal, excuse me, one local public health official who said the response was, quote, incoherent, confusing, and uncoordinated. This was especially true with regard to the medical supply chain. Early on, there was a serious and damaging perception that medical supplies and personal protective equipment were not being distributed to the places in the country that had the greatest need, but rather based on other motives, whether they be political or personal. Governors and local officials who competed for months for life-saving supplies often saw the federal government redirect those supplies without explanation. Now, some might say that with the COVID threat still real and present, that this isn't the time to look backward, but we need to be learning these lessons in real time. We can't afford to just keep repeating the mistakes of the past. And while the Biden administration has straightened out much of this confusion, this committee obviously has the responsibility to fund FEMA in a way that doesn't doom us to the same failures the next time a pandemic hits. Of course, we also want to hear today about the agency's present state of operations. We need to know how the Defense Production Act authorities are being used, what FEMA is doing to ensure an equitable distribution of vaccine support, and we need to know about the financial health of the Disaster Relief Fund. And while COVID-19 will obviously be the primary subject of this hearing, FEMA does face other challenges. Currently, the agency is supporting 960 declared disasters across the country at least one in every single state and territory. We spend a lot of time focusing on the emergency response, but we should also be talking about focusing on investments that make us more resilient. Uh, with that in mind, I'll have questions about FEMA's implementation of what's known as the BRIC program. That's the money we use to build resiliency in our communities. And we'll also wanna look at how FEMA is assisting efforts at the Southwest border. Senator Capano and I were there recently uh, and obviously FEMA is deeply engaged in helping the Department of Health and Human Services find suitable facilities for unaccompanied children and funding assistance to support local social service agencies to provide humanitarian relief. There's a lot to cover today, uh, and I look forward to your testimony, Mr. Fenton. Um, and I'll now turn to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Senator Capito, for any opening remarks. Yes, thank you, Chairman uh, Murphy, and congratulations on your first hearing. You're doing a great job so far. <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to working with you and, and really getting to know you. We've already had, uh, on our trip to the border, had an opportunity, even though we've served together for several years, 
to really forge the relationship that I think is going to be important as we move through fiscal year 2021 and begin to formulate the bill for um, fiscal year 2022. So I thank you for scheduling this hearing. FEMA is exceedingly important and their role in supporting our state and local partners in responding and recovering from a historic number of uh, disasters facing our nation. I think all of us in our individual states get to know our our, F our FEMA regional and local reps very, very well. So I want to thank the acting administrator, Robert Fenton, who I has learned is, has the, has obviously has very good sense because he's married to a West Virginian. So thank you for that. Thanks for joining us here today. FEMA's mission is helping people before, during, and after disasters. These words are more important than ever. And the acting administrator, Fenton, knows, and we all know, he has a big job to ensure FEMA continues to live up to those, to that promise. We're keeping a close eye on the progress we're making concerning COVID-19, including many of the areas the chairman talked about, the various federal support mechanisms in place to distribute much-needed PPE, vaccines, and other necessary supplies and personnel to combat the pandemic. FEMA is playing an integral role in that effort, helping to support vaccine distribution centers, re resupply our states with necessary PPE, and providing additional resources to ensure success. We have also been following the recent non-COVID-related disasters, including severe winter storms, damaging to, uh, tornadoes. We even talked about the situation in Texas a bit, flooding and fire events across the nation. FEMA is also playing an integral role in the current border crisis, working with HHS and other DHS components to identify, procure, and manage an array of temporary shelters and processing centers for the thousands of unaccompanied children crossing our southern border. Mr. Fenton, the men and women of FEMA are a vast network of responders coordinating the full spectrum, and we want to say thank you for what you do. Speaking of the border crisis, I would be remiss if I did not say some additional words on this topic. Last month, Sen Secretary Mayorkas acknowledged that we are headed towards more southwest border encounters than we've seen in 20 years, and the numbers are proving him correct. In March, CBP faced 172,331 encounters at the southwest border, which is 66% higher uh, than the March of the last border surge, which was in March of 2019, where there were 103,731 encounters. We can't dismiss these numbers as a seasonal migration pattern. DHS has been forced to set up multiple influx facilities to deal with the surge at the border. HHS has already set up 10 emergency facilities to house nearly 20,000 migrant children, spending $60 million a week in conditions even HHS will admit amount to little more than crisis care. CBP was so overwhelmed that the Washington Post has reported that they are seeing 1,000 getaways per day. That's, that's the folks we don't get and we don't encounter on the border. That's tens of thousands of individuals who are now in this country who all we really know about them is a fleeting footprint or maybe an article of clothing they left behind. In addition, CBP has had to resort to releasing illegal immigrants from custody into the United States without a notice to appear in immigration court, which is what I can describe as nothing less than a failure of our nation's immigration system. FEMA, which we are here to discuss, has been at the southwest border, and we appreciate that help because obviously describing what I am describing, it's very much needed. So, Mr. Chairman, I would ask, and I appreciate this hearing, I hope that we can, in the near future, have a discussion on this border crisis, and it is something that's staring us in the face. It's going to have a lot of uh, input into uh, our jurisdiction in terms of funding, uh, and I think that hopefully that we can cannot continue to encourage by policies or others uh, migrants to come in and enter our country, making that very dangerous journey. Uh, and so I also think that we will need to make sure that CBP and ICE are fulfilling and e executing their mandate under the law. Mr. Chairman, I hope you and I can work together on these goals in the future. Returning to the topic of hand, and I'll, I'll try to be briefer here, FEMA continues to see a high level of incident management workforce deployments, with only 21% of the personnel remaining for deployment to future events. I thought this was an interesting fact. Out of the 52 federal coordinating officers that FEMA currently deploys for disaster management, there is only one remaining who is not assigned to an existing declared disaster. So our manpower is getting low. The men and women of FEMA 
perform very diverse array of duties, and, and I think that's something, as we're looking at funding, we should look at. So um, financially, FEMA executed an extraordinary level of funding because of uh, the CARES packages and the COVID release and the great strain on the disaster relief fund. Um, they, uh, $68 billion for state, local, and tribal assistance, including National Guard deployments, close to $60 billion remaining in the disaster fund. It would seem that our resources would be sufficient, but they're going out the door very, very quickly. So, uh, and our, uh, our data is giving us a different story in terms of how we're going to be able to maintain a sufficient level of funding for FEMA. On a, on a personal note, as I'm sure you all, the, the three of us in the room here, have seen the impact FEMA has and can have during a, and after a disaster. The COVID response, reopening, and, and operating support FEMA provides continues to provide to West Virginia after our flood are much appreciated. Uh, in 2016, we lost 23 lives that day, hundreds of homes, millions of dollars in damages. And almost five years later, we still remember the things that we lost and recognize the ongoing efforts. I would like to thank you and your now Deputy Ad Acting Administrator, Mary Ann Tierney, who I mentioned to you is our, was our regional uh, uh, director for, for her, her and your continued attention to this recovery. So that's one of the, did you say 900 disasters that are still ongoing? It's just, and it, it takes so long sometimes to rebuild. So thank you for appearing with us today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Capito. By way of introduction, uh, our witness is the acting FEMA administrator. Uh, while not serving as the acting administrator, uh, Mr. Fenton is the FEMA Region 9 administrator. Uh, it's a career position. He's been with FEMA since 1996, and he's been involved um, in a number of significant large-scale response and recovery operations, including uh, Katrina, the Southern California wildfires of 2003, and the 9-11 World Trade Center terrorist uh, attacks. Uh, we appreciate you being before us today. Following your opening statement, each member is going to be recognized by seniority uh, for up to five minutes for statement and question. Good morning, uh, Chairman Murphy and Ranking Member Capito and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss FEMA's role in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is really an unprecedented challenge that has claimed the lives of over 558,000 of our neighbors, friends, family members across the country, caused grave damage to the global economy, and put a spotlight on inequities throughout our nation. At FEMA, we are committed to ensuring that everyone has access to vaccination. This is our highest priority, and its success is dependent upon the whole community being unified to achieve this goal. Our current work can be grouped into three broad categories. First, at the President's direction, FEMA is reimbursing 100% of the costs of the Title 32 National Guard activations, as well as 100% of eligible emergency protective measures uh, expenses incurred by states, local, tribal, and territorial partners in response to COVID-19 through September 30th. This includes reimbursement for vaccination efforts, screening and testing, and personal protective equipment. The president, the president also directed FEMA to expand the eligibility of emergency protective measures from January through September of this year to support the safe opening and operating of public facilities. This includes, uh, among other things, eligible schools, child care facilities, transit systems uh, of those that have been impacted by COVID-19. Second, FEMA is working to support state, territorial, uh, tribal and local governments led community vaccination efforts, also known as CVCs. FEMA is doing this through the deployment of federal personnel, the provision of equipment, supplies, and technical assistance, and the awarding of expedited financial assistance. Third, and finally, FEMA is teamed up with the Department of Defense and other agencies in establishing pilot CVCs across the country. These sites are stood up in partnership with state and local authorities to better reach underserved and historically marginalized communities. These CVC sites come with additional temporary eight-week vaccine allocation and is above and beyond the normal state allocation, and some can administer up to 6,000 vaccinations a day. As of April 12th, FEMA is obligated more than $4.53 billion for COVID-19 vaccination efforts. There are uh, 1,567 federally supported vaccination sites uh, and 357 mobile units, including these 30 pilot uh, community vaccination sites that have been stood up since January 20th. Uh, to date, 
189.6 million vaccine doses have been administered across the United States, with 172 million of those taking place since President Biden was inaugurated. Furthermore, the administration has been able to provide states and territories with a three-week vaccination supply uh, allocation. As of early April, this allocation stood at approximately 26.8 million doses, and over the last three over the last three weeks, close to 90 million total doses have been sent to states, tribes, territories, uh, and through federal channels. President uh, Biden. Uh, has made equity a cornerstone of the administration's COVID-19 efforts. And at FEMA, we've established a civil rights advisory group with our federal partners to ensure equity is incorporated into all of our activities. Since its inception in January, the civil rights advisory group has supported the development of the methodology to use to determine federally-led community vaccine pilot site selections, has worked with all 10 FEMA regions to collect and analyze demographic data, has identified underserved communities and collaborated with community-based organizations. As of early April, 58% of all doses administered at the uh, federally-led pilot CVCs went to communities of color. We have reason to be hopeful in the months ahead. We expect that vaccine supplies will continue to increase substantially in the months to come so that everyone who wants a vaccine will have access to one. In closing, we greatly appreciate the subcommittee's steadfast support for FEMA's efforts throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and for appropriating the resources our agency has needed to meet the historic mission requirements. I'd just like to uh, end with uh, saying how much of an honor it is to be the acting administrator and lead, in my eyes, uh, the finest group of civil servants that I've had the uh, opportunity to work with. Uh, their uh, ability to work tirelessly through uh, disaster after disaster uh, to help Americans uh, when at the greatest need uh, just shows you uh, how dedicated this workforce is in the challenging times that you've all highlighted. So thank you for taking the opportunity to testify. And I look forward to answering your questions today. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you very much for, for your service and your willingness to talk to us today. Um, you obviously have had a unique uh, seat um, managing a regional response uh, to the pandemic. And as I mentioned at the outset, um, I do want to focus on present efforts, in particular the vaccination campaign. But I do think it makes sense to um, do some retrospective here to make sure that we are learning lessons in real time. Um, and so I wanted to turn to this question uh, about overlapping responsibilities. FEMA was given this lead role in the whole of government federal response back in March of last year. But as you know, uh, there was widespread confusion amongst policymakers uh, and state level uh, implementers uh, about who was in charge, whether FEMA was in charge, HHS was in charge, or the White House was in charge. Um, we can't sort of wait uh, to do a year long retrospective and inquiry before uh, trying to make amends for that confusion. So I'd love your perspective, um, having sat in Region 9, um, to tell us what you think FEMA's role should be, um, let's say vis-a-vis -vis HHS, during a nationwide public health incident like a pandemic. Uh, how can we learn from our mistakes over the last year to make sure there are clear lines of authority uh, for state and local public health uh, officials, governors, members of Congress? Thank you, uh, Congressman, for uh, the uh, Senator, for the question. Uh, apologies. Uh, uh, let me just start off by saying uh, the last year was uh, a the most complex event that I've ever had the opportunity of responding to in my 25 years of being in this field in emergency management, and uh, is really a maximum maximum event. Uh, never did we anticipate that uh, we would have such a large event not only impact. Uh, the nation's uh, capability, but let alone the world's capability. And so when you look at events like this, I think emergency management at all levels of government uh, has a responsibility to be a coordinating function. And I think that is something that FEMA does really well is coordinate and communicate all levels of government, both vertically and horizontally, um, and connect with not only government, but private sector, private nonprofits, uh, uh, and uh, and others to ensure that 
everyone is working toward a common set of goals and unity of effort. Um, it, it's difficult. Uh, it was difficult to do uh, last year at the beginning of the event um, because of the different authorities, uh, the uniqueness of the medical event, uh, and starting off with the event being managed by HHS and then eventually transitioning in March to uh, FEMA taking the lead of it. It took us uh, a little bit of period of time to get the coordination mechanisms that traditionally haven't been involved in a medical only event to come together and unify uh, those efforts at all levels of government uh, across a private sector, a private nonprofit. And it's something that we continue to work on and improve uh, throughout the summer and in response to COVID. So I, I spent about a month uh, last summer trying to understand the emergency medical supply chain uh, and trying to understand who from the federal government was doing what. I spent about a month talking to anybody that I could, and I think I left that month more confused at the end than I was going in. And in fact, in the report that FEMA released in January, um, FEMA noted that neither HHS nor FEMA understood the domestic supply chain at the beginning of this response. So to what extent were agencies aware of this knowledge gap and what's being done right now to identify and manage those gaps in advance of future incidents? And then who really should be the lead with respect to this question of supply chain management? Should this be FEMA? Should this be HHS? And how do we make sure that we're not sort of caught unaware in the way that um, we were last uh, spring and summer? So um, the, from the organizational standpoint, the National Response Coordination Center, when stood up uh, uh, nationally, is the overall coordinating mechanism. Uh, what they did was establish a supply uh, chain task force to focus in on the medical supplies of this event. Um, and it took them uh, some time to get a hold of and an understanding of that supply chain. It's very complex as far as uh, you know, who are the big manufacturers, where's the manufacturing happening at, where are the resources needed to do the manufacturing? What is the capacity of that within the United States, with outside the United States? And so those were all things that took them time to kind of wrap their hands around. At the same time, funding is going out to state and local governments, and they're taking the necessary action to go procure the needed resources uh, to be able to combat uh, COVID. So there, there is uh, a little bit of complexity at the beginning to get unity of effort going, uh, and it's something that we uh, continue to work through uh, during the summer months. Going forward, um, there's a number of things that are happening right now. Uh, there's specific, um, you know, not only does FEMA have a role to provide uh, coordination and through executive order last year, had some responsibility to uh, look specifically at some of the medical supplies but more importantly, we have now a much better understanding of our supply chains and understanding that a just-in-time supply chain isn't sufficient to meet the challenges of a worldwide pandemic. And so what we've done over the last year is be able to understand that supply chain, understand where those manufacturers are, what their capability is within the U.S., outside the U.S., where the resource dependency is at. And what we're now doing is working to uh, build uh, capability and relationships to better be able to share information to include uh, stockpiling resources both within the federal level at the state level uh, but more importantly uh, ensuring that private sector is part of that and they're also building capability and that uh, medical institutions are doing the same thing so it's really a a whole of community effort uh, recognizing that everyone has parts and responsibility of that working through each organization's authorities uh, with FEMA assisting and coordinating uh, 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 many parts of this. I'm going to turn this over to Senator Capito, but I do maybe on a second round want to follow up with you with this question of um, how we learn from our experience in overlapping distribution systems uh, and procurement systems, whether it's appropriate to have state systems um, overlaid with federal systems, overlaid with private sector systems, and how we can sort of learn from that, that duplication of effort. Uh, but at this point, I'll turn it over to Senator Capito to be followed by Senator Sheen. Legislative Thank you. change that would be required, it, it seems to me that yeah. that is not the intent of what we 
sure. um, meant when we passed the CARES Act. Yeah, so let me, I'd be glad to look into that specific question and get back to you. Um, our intent is not to duplicate other forms of assistance like insurance uh, and, and other uh, sure. avenues of funding. But let me look into that specific issue and I'd be glad to work with your office and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate now that, that. I understand exactly what you're saying now. Thank yeah. Um, I also want to follow up a little bit on Senator Murphy's questions about the supply chain, because one of the things that we've heard from companies in New Hampshire is that they, many of them have altered their manufacturing capabilities to try and respond to the pandemic. And what they are concerned about is that the federal government gets these materials from foreign sources and even though they've been asked to step up, they will then be in the position of having to shut down those manufacturing lines or do something different. So can you talk about how FEMA's coordinating with um, HHS and other federal agencies so that you utilize the Defense Production Act to ensure that we have an adequate supply, but that we don't put companies in the position of changing their manufacturing facilities and then deciding to procure uh, supplies from other places. Yeah, so uh, there's many parts of the Defense Production Act, and FEMA uh, chairs uh, Title I, which is set in priority orders. But there's other parts uh, with regard to um, Title VII that looks at set in voluntary agreements, and Title III that looks at expansions of uh, you know stimulating economy and, and stimulus and. You know, I think to your point, what needs to happen is we need to, and, and, and have been doing this for the last uh, about six months, is working with different sectors, uh, especially with regret, related to the pandemic, to start understanding of what the capability is uh, within the U.S. manufacturing, where do the resources coming from, and start to have those discussions now and be able to share information from private sector to government sector working with DOJ and Federal Trade Communication uh, Commission to share that information to make better informed decisions in the future. And I think that's where we're headed right now. That's what we've learned from this event. Um, you know, I think if you go back uh, to last summer, it was everyone trying to get whatever they could from wherever they could. Right. And it wasn't a uh, coordinated collective effort uh, and continue to work on it through the end of summer and probably not till the end of summer did, did it really come together in some uh, way. Going forward, I think we need to continue to do that, not only for a pandemic, but for other um, you know, high risk events that may impact you know, the nation's supply chain in any one field. So it could be an earthquake and you know, the damage is multiple homes. How do we bring back on you know, 10,000 homes in a, in a quick period of time? And so we need to start having these discussions with private sector, and there's a way to do that through the Defense Production Act underneath uh, Title VII and start to share information uh, so that uh, we're able to leverage everything the United States has. And would you expect that FEMA would continue to be the lead agency on this, or will, do you well, see think, that shifting? Yeah, I think we're one of them. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, we're one of the key entities to do this. We do deliberate planning for high-risk, high-threat events across the country, but there's other federal agencies that have key responsibilities within the Defense Production Act, um, Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation, Energy, HHS, USDA. So they all, uh, HHS, uh, they all need to have uh, responsibility for their specific uh, right. functional area, uh, their portfolio. But uh, we uh, definitely have uh, a responsibility uh, when doing uh, the planning for whole government to, um, to make sure that there's a coordinated effort. Yeah, and that was sort of the concern that I think Senator Murphy was getting to, is that if we've got a bunch of agencies who are working on this, who's actually in charge of prioritizing what needs to be done? Yeah, so we have responsibility to chair um, the Title I side of things and, and the prioritization. We don't have authority to chair Title Three and specific um, expansion of economy or stimulus to each one of those departments and agencies. So Department of Energy does it within their organization, HHS within theirs. Now we've gained a little bit through an executive order last year with HHS, and, and but for the rest of them, we traditionally don't. And so um, one of the things we do do is do catastrophic planning so we can identify those gaps so then those agencies could be responsible for building that capacity. So um, I think 
through the planning efforts we do with state and local governments, we should you know, work on identifying where those big gaps are and those, those uh, significant events that we face based on risks in our country uh, to allow those federal agencies then to take their authority and build capacity or at least start the discussion with private sector to make sure that we have a well thought out plan and we're not doing it just in time when the event happens. So I'm out of time, but do you think the Defense Production Act needs to be changed in any way to address that concern? Well, I, it's a, I, I think it's a good question. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, um, I would say that there, it provides, it's one tool of many tools mm -hmm. to get at the solution. Other tools are let's deal with the risk in front and mitigate the risk. We talked a little bit earlier about brick and right. mitigation and other things. Um, and there's many other things we could do, but I think it's one tool. Um, you know, I think we can continue to look at it, but I don't see FEMA having oversight over like Department of Energy on on energy. I just it's just not our expertise, and yeah. so I think energy needs to do that, uh, and then and then be responsible for it. Our HHS and be responsible for it. Um, as far as us coordinating the committee for prioritization, I think that's something we could do and, and relates to uh, disasters uh, in doing that and, and uh, being able to respond to uh, events and do priority ratings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheen. We should have Senator Hoven virtually. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fenton, I guess my first question relates to the city of Washburn, North Dakota on February 2nd. Uh, our uh, congressional delegation sent a letter in support of their the city's request for an extension on their pre-disaster mitigation grant. Uh, can you uh, give me an update on that request? Yeah, the, yeah. the applications for PDM are in the system and being evaluated, and I will go ahead and, uh, and uh, get back to you specifically on uh, that request, but uh, I'm not aware of... Uh, uh, any decisions being made uh, on the BRIC program yet? Yeah, if you could get me a timeline. I mean, yeah. if you give me an answer, that'd be great. Uh, and But if not, if you could get me a kind of an estimated timeline for a response. Uh, yes, sir. Be okay, thank you. Um, can you further describe FEMA's role as it relates to uh, migrants coming across the border illegally? Yeah, FEMA's yeah. role is in support of uh, HHS and their authorities and role in CBP. Uh, we don't have any specific authority uh, with regard to uh, the border. We are supporting them underneath the Economy Act and providing them uh, technical assistance uh, right now. Are you assisting with um, or testing and making sure that illegal migrants that come across are being tested for COVID? Anyone that is in the United States uh, that is uh, at risk for COVID would fall underneath uh, our authorities right now as it relates to uh, the pandemic and uh, being able to reimburse state and local governments for testing and for anyone who tests positive uh, for uh, quarantine uh, up to uh, 10 days. So that's something that anyone within the United States that uh, uh, you know, has is symptomatic that local government or state government feels that they need to test, have that ability to test them and for us to reimburse them. Is that being done at, at the border? That's being done throughout the whole United States, in, including the border. And uh, it's not specific to the border. It's specific to uh, the communities within uh, that are in the, those proximity and they have the, th the authority and the ability to do that if if uh, if they elect to do that. If they elect to do it, yeah, right. So it may or may not be do being done. Yeah, so it, it, it depends on each specific uh, you know uh, state health and local health laws or any authority of the county or state, and it's up to each state or county. For example, I know because I'm in Region Nine that California has a, uh, a, a very robust testing program and, and testing. I, I do know that there are a number of um, non-government organizations down there that are, uh, that are doing testing of uh, individuals at the border, but uh, it's specifically up to a state. It's something that's 100% reimbursable if a state or local government uh, decides to do it. In addition to that, we've sent 
uh, you know, tens of thousands of test kits uh, to Texas and other states uh, that they can use, uh, you know, within their state, uh, whether it be in the southern part of the state or other areas. So your role is assisting if they elect to do it? Our, yeah, our role is to reimburse the costs of testing for the whole United States, and it's it, uh, mandating someone to test within the United States is uh, a decision up to the local uh, health official or state health official. We can't mandate testing. That's their decision. In, 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 terms, in terms of manpower, um, is the, is, do you have adequate manpower? Are you being strained because of the border? No, the, the border is probably less than 200 <clears throat> staff deployed to the border uh, or to our headquarters and to some of the shelters uh, in the southern United States, and it's not uh, impacting our deployments. We have about 10,000 people out of that maybe less than 13,000 are available for deployment that are deployed right now. The majority of those are to uh, COVID, uh, to the vaccination effort, or to other disaster activity. My last question relates to how much COVID funding that FEMA has received, uh, and then uh, how is that going in terms of, you know, how much have you dispersed, and are you sure you're able to get them out, uh, you know, expeditiously as needed? Yeah, I, we just received the additional $50 billion of uh, funding. Um, we are starting to implement the funeral assistance program uh, that we project uh, $2 billion from last year, I think uh, 2 to $3 billion from this year. Um, we, uh, the part of the reopening um, of schools, public facilities, transportation, uh, will be a significant additional uh, portion of funding. Uh, going back and uh, changing the cost share to 100% uh, will be additional uh, funding. And then we've, as I said earlier, $4.5 billion already in the vaccination effort for the first 90 days. So we have sufficient funding right now. I project based on uh, the new authorities uh, we received and the appropriation uh, and the president's executive order that we should have sufficient funding to get us through to the end of the fiscal year to include uh, what would be normally projected disaster activity at that time of year, which includes hurricanes and fires. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Hovind. Um, we'll go to a second round of uh, questions. Uh, we appreciate you sticking with us. I've just got uh, two. Um, the first, I wanted to return to this question of uh, responsibility for supply chain management. As you know, um, virtually every state in the nation uh, scrambled to set up their own supply chain for PPE, in particular in the early stages of the um, pandemic. And I think a simple question that states are asking right now is, they, is should they be preparing uh, to have to stand up their own supply chain for the next pandemic? Because if that is the case, there are you know, decisions, some of them very expensive, that states will make, for instance, to you know, keep a manufacturer in state with the capability to be able to make uh, certain types of masks or face shields. Or do we expect that we are going to sort of solve for this problem and when the and when and if the next pandemic hits states will not have to build their own supply chain and there will be an adequate complete federal response either through stockpiles or through the management of federal and international supply chains to um, meet the need what what's sort of your advice right now for states as they're starting to decide how they want to spend money in in advance of the next potential um, outbreak? So I think it's a collective effort. Um, what we've asked and provided funding to state and local governments to do is to uh, go ahead and uh, build the capacity. Most states have built a 60 to uh, some up to 120 day capacity of, um, of personal protective equipment, and other medical supplies that would be needed for a pandemic. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, the strategic national stockpile has built capacity within that. Uh, the medical uh, providers, uh, private sector providers, are uh, building additional capacity. And I've seen hospitals now start to increase their capacity. I think the reliance on a just-in-time logistics system, which we've gotten used to in the United States because it's been so efficient on being able to deliver resources, works uh, except when you have a 
catastrophic event that impacts that supply chain. So you need to build capacity at all levels of government to withstand, uh, you know, when there is a uh, when there's a run on a specific uh, uh, resource, um, and uh, go ahead and not only build the capacity to allow manufacturing to catch up, but also to ensure there's sufficient supply to do that. Um, that's just part of the the issue is building that capacity. The second part is. We need to be able to increase manufacturing, and how long does that take to do that? Where is the capacity to do that? Uh, you know, what private sectors maybe can retool and do that quickly, uh, and then where do the supplies and material come from to do that? So it's a complex decision. I think we all have part of that, including private sector has responsibilities uh, to that. We have to understand uh, maybe where the gaps are uh, within that system. Uh, to make sure that we have contingency plans to uh, to uh, respond adequately to that. So it's a collective effort. So, I mean, I certainly understand that it's state's responsibility to build up reserves. I do think it's a, a, a an important question for us to answer as to whether it is state's responsibility to build up that sort of slack manufacturing capacity essentially pay money to hold it in reserve. That is a very specific set of expertise that states prior to the pandemic did not have um, and would require every state to have, you know, a level of visibility into their own sort of state-based supply chain that we normally don't ask, you know, we don't ask states to get involved in that question in large part because it's kind of arbitrary what amount of manufacturing you have in your state when it comes to masks or face shields. Um, it strikes me that that question should really be one dealt with at the federal level. Um, but are you, maybe you don't have an answer now, it's okay, but well, are you suggesting that the states are going to sort of, we're going to have to have 50 different um, strategies to create uh, slack capacity for the manufacturing of medical supplies? Or will that question be more uh, a function of federal oversight and policy? Yeah, I think to that specific piece, uh, and in fact, the uh, appropriation to HHS to provide that underneath Title III of DPA, that's where they should then work with private sector to uh, be able to build uh, that capacity. And, and uh, I know that right now uh, we're working in a number of efforts along with HHS uh, to work with private sector to how to build uh, capacity. So DOD received a billion dollars in uh, the last uh, appropriation and, and HHS received, I think it was $10 billion um, yeah, underneath um, Defense Production Act, uh, Title III, to uh, work with private sector to build that additional capacity. And, and uh, that's, I think, the best place for that to be done at, um, unless there's something unique maybe to a local government, a rural government, uh, with regard to relationships to uh, some private sector within that area. I, I just think we have to be as clear as possible with states as to what their obligations are yep. and what their obligations aren't, because they obviously got into the business of doing all sorts of things over the last year that they uh, weren't expecting to do. And I think they want to know now whether those are sort of permanent new functions that are outsourced to them or whether this was a one-time only request. So look forward to working with you and HHS and the administration on delivering that clarity. Um, with the uh, Senator Capito's, um, uh, uh, if she'll allow me, I have one additional question, which is um, on um, outreach uh, with respect to vaccination efforts. So we're getting to um, the point where we hope there will be an adequate supply of vaccination um, and we will be um, in the position of uh, a deficit of demand uh, and that we will have to be going out and doing outreach to harder to reach communities or individuals who are skeptical about vaccines to uh, convince them of the merits of that vaccination. That, of course, requires not just having the vaccination site set up, but having education and outreach efforts funded. Um, and I want to just sort of ask about the ways in which states can apply to get that reimbursed. There's 100% reimbursement, but there may be circumstances in which you have an outreach worker who, for instance, is going out and you know, trying to uh, contact chronically truant students at school, but who will also do education on vaccination uh, during that outreach visit. 
Do you foresee any difficulty in making sure that states get adequate reimbursement when um, some of the outreach efforts that are going to be necessary throughout the end of the year may be intermingled with other functions that public health workers are doing, for instance, that might not be eligible for reimbursement? Well, so there's a number of efforts going on right now uh, to uh, vaccinate um, uh, ensure everyone has the opportunity to get vaccinated. And, and you bring up a number of uh, issues, whether it's vaccine hesitancy, whether it's uh, availability um, to uh, get uh, individuals vaccinated. Uh, I do think there's specific resources available, uh, both in HHS's appropriation and in our appropriation. And I think those activities are covered between those appropriations, uh, specifically uh, depending on what the individual is doing. It may be our appropriation or it may be HHS's uh, Based on your description, most of what we're providing reimbursement for is the protective measures, the, the um, you know, N95 masks, uh, the, um, uh, any um, uh, protective barriers, um, you know, testing, um, anything that is an immediate protective measure to reopen. And then the other federal agencies are funding efforts to uh, maybe do outreach and investigation. Plus, we are also assisting with a community outreach uh, campaign right now uh, with HHS, uh, CDC, uh, and state and local agencies. And we're bringing vaccine through a, many different efforts to include uh, mobile units, which are, which are anything to do with actually vaccinating uh, would be eligible. So all the mobile units that we're providing support for, the National Guard, the vaccinators, all those kind of things would be eligible. But I'd be glad to work with your community and specifically understand uh, the specific issues and make sure we uh, provide them guidance on the most appropriate funding mechanism. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Senator Capito. Thank you. I just have two quick questions. Um, looking to the future, obviously, um, uh, hurricane and wildfire seasons are sort of around the corner. You and I talked. I actually asked you, uh, being a native Californian, if if there were if anything was on fire, and, and unfortunately, uh, fortunately, no, um, and that's good, but. Um, I know that you can you continue. Are, are you concerned with the way you're spread out through COVID and everything else, uh, anticipating fire and hurricane seasons? Or you've you've mentioned that you have um, uh, adequate uh, uh, staffing availabilities for for any disasters. But I was just curious and wondering to know if you're concerned about what could happen during these two seasons. Yeah, well, I'm in the business of uh, risk management and prioritization. And so uh, if there's uh, events that happen uh, that require uh, a life-saving response, I, I feel comfortable that we will always be able to respond to that mm -hmm. event with uh, the federal government's capability. Uh, in addition to what FEMA has right now and still about 2,500 personnel left that are responders that could go out to events, um, I'm leveraging right now 500 people from uh, the whole federal government to help me with the vaccination effort. So I would leverage more on the rest of the federal government. Right now we have about uh, 9,000 people deployed to do vaccination, and that includes about 4,500 or 5,000 DOD personnel. So it's always a concern. It's something I watch, uh, and, and I look at future threat, and I manage that risk to make sure that we have enough resources. But it's the response is bigger than FEMA, it's state and local government, and all the capability they bring in. It's all the non-disaster grants, the $2 billion we put out a year to build that capacity. Um, we continue to do that, to build that capability so that collectively we can respond to those events. Mm -hmm. um, over the last uh, several years, with your 25 years of experience, I'm interested to, to know what situation has been your biggest challenge? Has it been the COVID response or were you was it a particular other disaster event that you would say was probably the most difficult one that you've had the difficult challenge i would say yeah well, obviously the the biggest um impact i've ever seen the most deaths is covid uh it's just um you know what is done to our country shut down our economy uh the impact it's had uh you know far beyond uh, physical damage that we traditionally see uh, in other disasters. It's just been, um, uh, you know, it has been far greater than any other disaster I've been to. Um, so, and, and having the whole government, the whole 
country and the whole world affected at once has just been uh, significant. I would, I would put that up there with, uh, you know, 9-11 and Katrina, uh, you know, on my list of the biggest events uh, that I've been involved with, all for different reasons and some, you know, geographically unique, um, but uh, all emotionally uh, impacted, I think, uh, or at least the whole country felt the impacts of those three events. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, as far as challenge, uh, you know, the, the challenge is always to me, uh, you know, I think we all collectively uh, have the same goal, you know, save people, help people. It's how we get there um, and how we do that underneath unity of effort. And when, we, when we're not unified, it makes it that much more challenging. So mm -hmm. it's important that we use the systems, NIMS, the National Response Framework, and all the systems that exist and the training that we provide to the whole government, uh, to state and local government, to private sector, how do we involve individuals, private citizens involved in that, uh, and, and how do we collectively get a unified effort uh, is what needs to happen in those big events. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask a quick question on the supplemental firefighter grants. Uh, we put a lot of uh, money into, uh, let's see, uh, a total of $400 million was provided for assistance to firefighter and safer grant programs. Of this amount, uh, 76 uh, has been obligated in the AFG, the assistance to firefighter grants. And um, I'm concerned about the volunteer firefighters. Apparently, uh, well, I've gotten numerous um, um, anecdotal evidence that because of the lockdown and, and with COVID that our, uh, our volunteer firefighters have not been able to raise the money that they would normally, like a boot drive or a bake sale or, or, or something else that they really rely on every year to raise uh, a lot of their discretionary dollars. And I, it, apparently it seems that the uh, volunteer firefighters, and we kept trying to direct them to this, pro to this, this program, uh, that they, sometimes they're, applications are not either sufficient or in a timely fashion or something like that. Is there any way that FEMA could be more helpful or we could be more helpful to FEMA to get information to our volunteer firefighters to know how and when and the best way to fill out these applications? Because uh, I, I believe some of the money has left, has been, um, uh, that was set aside for our volunteer fire fighters was not actually able to be used in that manner. Yeah, I'm not aware of uh, funding that has not been used. I know that there is uh, a focus effort of helping the volunteer firefighting organizations uh, apply for assistance. We've just implemented our new FEMA grants system that makes it a little bit easier to apply and track uh, some of the, the funding requests, but I'd be glad to uh, come back and uh, brief you on uh, some of the efforts that we're doing across the country to help and, and really see and reach out to those organizations uh, to see, um, you know, uh, what the issue is and, and if there's any gaps in assistance uh, based on what we've seen in the last year. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we'll follow up on that. Yeah. The one last question is, uh, the chairman mentioned in his comments that there's 900 ongoing uh, disasters. And maybe four or five years ago with the previous FEMA director, one of the ideas that was put forward uh, to me was some way to uh, unwind these disasters to uh, maybe state responsibilities or local responsibilities to get them off of the, I mean, that's an awful lot on a plate uh, for FEMA. Do you have any ideas on that? Or what do you see that's worked to be able to close the book on some of these disasters that I know some of them have been on for probably decades? Yeah, I think um, that sometimes... Uh when you take into account, uh, you know, all the requirements that are needed to close out these disasters and uh, whether it be uh, requirements for documentation, uh, building and permits, environmental, uh, and then all the auditing, uh, that sometimes it takes a while to uh, close these disasters out. I think that um, looking at some opportunities, whether it be state managed, which we've done in the past, um, or look at uh, things that allow for greater estimates across uh, and simplify the process. So, for example, our simplified procedures that look at large and small projects, right now that, that bar is a very low bar. 
And, uh, and so what happens is for large pro or small projects underneath one hundred and I think fifty thousand dollars, when there's a net small project underrun, they don't need to request that unless there's an overrun, right? Which makes the closeout much easier. So simply raising that bar um, mm -hmm. would allow, you know, would be less uh, complexity in the closeout part of that and give a little bit more flexibility to local governments on uh, how they use any uh, underruns uh, as long as it's used toward, um, you know, uh, you know, disaster. Uh, they would be able to use that, but yeah. So an underrun would be like unspent money that for the specific. Yeah. So let's say you had it, ten projects and you estimated a uh, hundred thousand dollars per project, uh -huh. and and at the end of the day you did it for eight hundred and seventy thousand dollars because of efficiencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, there'd be some incentive there to uh, local government to, you know, as long as yeah. they reuse that for maybe mitigation or something like that, they'd be right. able to and then close it, it out right. And it closes out much quicker yeah, yeah. than right now every project being to the exact penny. And that's the problem now is that okay. every project's to the exact penny. And, and anytime you have a program like that, we're incrementally adding dimes or dollars uh -huh. to close things out. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Capito. Let me uh, finish up with one last uh, question, um, and that's on the BRIC program. Uh, obviously, this has been a very popular uh, account uh, in 2020. FEMA was only able to fund about 14% of requested demand for pre-disaster mitigation projects. Um, I had an interesting meeting with some of my uh, emergency management personnel in Stratford, Connecticut, um, during the break. And one of the concerns they raised uh, was um, uh, concerns regarding the competitiveness of smaller jurisdictions' applications for funds when you have, um, you know, this much interest uh, and uh, particularly a lot of interest from larger jurisdictions in Connecticut. We don't have counties, so it's either the state of Connecticut applying or a municipality that may only have, you know, ten or 20,000 individuals. And, in fact, on the shoreline, um, where, you know, you've got some really important national assets like the Northeast Corridor uh, rail um, uh, line, uh, Interstate 95. Some of those communities, again, you know, only may have 15,000 people in them, and they worry about their ability to compete uh, for uh, brick um, uh, allocations, especially with these bigger jurisdictions um, putting together much larger applications. Um, you share, coming from Region 9, you've got big jurisdictions, small jurisdictions. Do you share that concern? Um, is there a way to make sure that small municipalities um, get to compete fairly alongside big counties uh, for brick dollars? Yeah, so within the brick program, there are uh some set asides uh, within there to uh, ensure that uh, there's opportunity. Uh, a couple of them are, uh, they've put aside $20 million just for tribes uh, so that uh, they're able to compete. And as I understand, a little bit over 60 tribes have uh, already submitted applications for this uh, BRIC program. Also for uh, small communities underneath 3,000, there's a uh, incentive for a modification of the cost share to 90% to help them, especially small impoverished uh, 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 jurisdictions uh, in that. We are also um, providing direct assistance to uh, sub sub grantees to help them with their application pro process and provide technical assistance in doing that. Uh, and so there's a number of things we're doing right now to ensure there's uh, equitable opportunity knowing that uh, you know, if you get to a small community, uh, they may not be aware of the program. They may not, may not be uh, knowledgeable on how to apply to it. So we're uh, helping with project scoping <clears throat> and uh, setting aside uh, funding to make sure there's some type of equitable uh, opportunity uh, for them to participate. Yeah, and you know the problem here when you're only funding 14%. Um, that's a disincentive to apply, in particular for jurisdictions that don't have an established grant writing yeah. operation. Maybe not as big a disincentive for a city or a county that's pumping out grant applications on a regular basis. They just sort of build in uh, a risk tolerance for uh, grant applications in a way that small communities cannot. So uh, that's not necessarily your problem. Um, that's a problem that will fall to the subcommittee when it comes to uh, looking at allocations 
allocations for these accounts. Um, but we frankly um, have exacerbated this difficulty by not allocating a share of COVID dollars into the BRIC account. It probably should be funded at a level closer to $4 billion um, than $500 billion, but uh, a subject for uh, for our work. One of the things I did in my region is I took the risk of fire, for example, which is very significant in my region, and I developed one-sheeters on different type of projects that we see done repetitively. So maybe, uh, you know, uh, special paint that helps with fire protection. It may be uh, clearing of brush. It may be changing the roof material. And what we've done is created these and, and help them understand what these projects are and then provide the complexity with regard to environmental uh, program, uh, program uh, legal issues that they would experience in California uh, submitting those applications. So we've helped them kind of scope these projects out so they're repeatable. And then the state of California through phased projects can actually start uh, building these projects. And, and my hope is over time that we have them on a shelf and you know we kind of build a conveyor belt of projects and then we just keep on repeating those type of projects to build resiliency in a harder infrastructure or make it more resilient to those threats that we face. Great. All set. All right, great. Well, thank you, uh, Acting Minister Fenton, for your testimony today. Thank you for your service uh, to the country. The hearing record is going to remain open for one week. Questions for the record should be submitted to the subcommittee staff by the close of business on Wednesday, April 21st. And so this subcommittee is now adjourned. Thank you.